Welcome everybody to another week. This is episode three of the Audit, Audit Change Show and we are catching up again with Jason Myers, the um, lead architect of Audit Chain. And he's been rearing to go to talk about uh, some exciting news. Uh, so hopefully we'll get into that. Um, if you're watching us on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel, turn your notifications on so you can catch up every time we have an update. And if you're listening to us on our audio podcast platforms, welcome again. So Jason, good to see you again. Hello, Yoli. Good to be here. And uh, so we're going to talk about the recent um, tentative decision by the Financial Accounting Standards Board. Um, why don't you kind of break it down for us in terms of what has currently been <clears throat> the uh, status quo? And then what is it that they announced this week that, uh, and what's the impact of the, of the change? Great question. <laughs> so you all know MicroStrategy, right? Yeah. This is something uh, Michael Saylor has been uh, very vocal about. And it's not only Michael Saylor, um, but in order to explain its impact, I have to explain micro strategy as it is currently constituted in the face of current accounting rules that right. force you to treat crypto assets as intangible assets. So first of all, what is an intangible asset? An intangible asset is intellectual property, patents, Copy, uh, copyrights, trademarks, yeah. um, some throw in the legal fees associated with prosecuting those patents, copyrights, trademarks. Sometimes um, brand, just brand, you know, like the value of a brand can be considered somewhat intangible. Uh, well, yes, but you book it at what you paid for, right? Yeah, your logo and your brand marks. Um, whatever it costs to file and have them issued is uh, the cost of the intangible asset, right? You book it at cost. You have the ability to impair the value, which means lower the valuation, right, right? Um, of an intangible asset. Uh, but nobody lowers the value of their brand marks. Um, what has been happening, and MicroStrategy is a prime example, is the Bitcoin that MicroStrategy owns was booked as an intangible asset. And when the price declined, uh, there was impairments to that value. Right. right. So this means that if the price of Bitcoin goes back up, there's no, the accounting rules make it extremely difficult to revalue that asset higher. That's what fair value accounting is for, right? You don't do that with intangible assets. Another example of an intangible asset, and it's probably the largest example on a balance sheet, and that is something called goodwill. Right. So what is goodwill? Um, in the case of for instance, a merger between two companies. Um, goodwill is the price or the value over and above the net tangible book value of the company that you're buying. So if you buy the company, if you acquire a company for a billion dollars, right, and its stockholders' equity is, let's say, uh, a quarter of a billion dollars, right? The value is attributable to total assets minus total liabilities plus the goodwill, right? I'm uh, sorry, to, uh, total assets, which includes goodwill, okay. right? And when you combine those two balance sheets together post-merger, that goodwill is now on the balance sheet of the surviving entity. It's essentially 
and I want to try to say this uh, in, 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 in a sensitive way. Um, it's the price some dope overpaid for an asset. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, um, but there's no real sort of way to kind of value it. No, well, look, if, 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 the, if the price of a stock is, is, is $100, right? Yeah. And let's say there's um, 10 million shares outstanding, right? Yeah. Got a billion dollar market cap. And then a suitor makes an offer to buy it for $200 a share. Right. And um, so what ends up happening is the goodwill is the difference between the price paid. Got it. The price, you know, the, the, the net tangible book value, right? And the price that you actually paid. Net tangible book value is total assets minus total liabilities minus goodwill. I see. Right? Okay. Okay. So goodwill is a large chunk of a balance sheet, right? I always, I always say, you know, by the time you pay somebody to dissolve, you know, uh, the hammer value, hammer value, liquidation yeah. value of a company, yeah, is always less than its market value, right? Which, when so I say hammer value. It's important like, to understand, right? If we right. dissolved it today, sold all of its assets, paid off all of its liabilities, right? Right. right. Yeah. So, so intangible assets didn't make sense for digital for, for digital assets or digital cryptocurrency in this case because um, if the market's going up or down, and MicroStrategy on the books it looks like there the, it's valued less. So they weren't able to sort of adjust it on as the market adjusts. They can adjust it downward, but it makes, Tesla did something in the last year. Yeah. And that's another example, right? Um, Tesla bought a billion and a half dollars worth of Bitcoin won. Everybody remembers that. Right. They also sold $272 million worth in March of the same okay. year, and it occurred in the same reporting period. Okay, it's the same right? quarter, right. Correct. Now, they sold $272 million worth at a profit. I see, there but was on the books. Hold on a second. There was a gain on the sale of the $272 million that they got for that portion of the Bitcoin, right? Because Bitcoin had gone up in that period. It was gone up, it went up, that's correct. Okay. Now they used it as a basis to adjust the value upward, but they couldn't get the whole value onto the balance sheet. Because you can't, again, it's extremely difficult to revalue an intangible asset. But when you sell a portion of the same asset, there are tricks that you can play. But that was, you know, could have been a once in a lifetime thing. You never know, because they bought it cheap. It went up. They sold some. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They booked the game and played a little game that allowed them the leeway to revalue that asset in their books. But that doesn't happen all the time. Right. right? It was a freak thing during a bull market that, you know, took the price of Bitcoin up in the same period sufficiently enough for them to sell a portion of it, right? So, but in MicroStrategy's case, um, MicroStrategy is a traditional entity that holds 90% of an, 90% uh, of its assets are Bitcoin. Bitcoin is, Bitcoin is an open ledger based asset. If it moves, right. you can see it on the blockchain, right? Yeah, yeah. And then to make matters more complex, the traditional entity holding an open ledger based asset is shrouded behind a periodic disclosure framework. Right. Right. Every so, quarter. Correct. Every right. quarter they make their disclosures. We're on the Bitcoin blockchain. We, 
it's real time. It's real time, right? It's real time. Right. So in MicroStrategy's case, um, the difference between booking Bitcoin uh, and most other liquid uh, digital assets, uh, Ethereum, uh, Cardano, even Ripple, right? Most, most of the ones that 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 are immediately convertible into cash, right. right? There's nothing intangible about Bitcoin. The truth is, in here in Switzerland, it's treated as a current asset, the way a marketable security is, right? Right. If you can immediately convert it into cash. It's part of your current assets, right? Treasury bills, treasury bonds are immediately convertible into cash. Other securities, short-term instruments are immediately convertible into cash. Cash itself is a current asset, right? Bitcoin, um, under the new proposed rules, allows you to do fair market accounting, which means you can remarket higher if it goes higher. And that will allow a company like MicroStrategy to disclose more accurately the underlying the value of all of their assets on their balance sheet, right? Yeah. And they'll describe the accounting policy and the accounting pronouncement, the accounting rule that they use to apply that fair value accounting methodology, right? They'll disclose all this in their 10Ks. And, and right. Doesn't that just basically just for the for the rest of us, just regular layman folks, doesn't that just mean whatever it, the current price is on the, on the market or whatever somebody's willing to pay for it? Well, the market price is what somebody else is willing to pay for it. OK, so that's so I mean, is there a reason why they call it fair value? Like, why isn't it just the market price? Fair value accounting is an assertion by management that values an asset. Okay. Okay. Now, how okay. do they make that assertion? Well, they make a determination. How do they determine it? They look at the market price and they look at a variety of market centers, right? Venues where it trades, right? They may look on Coinbase. They may look yeah. on several other exchanges and determine the value. But keep in mind, Bitcoin is a highly liquid asset. Yeah. It trains billions and billions of dollars worth of Bitcoin in volume every single day. And if I wanted to sell 500 million or a billion dollars worth, I can do it in a relatively short period of time, either direct market sales or over-the-counter transactions, right? Got it. So they're not going to revalue it every day because they only report once every 90 days, every yeah. quarter, every quarter, right? So they'll make the assessment at the end of the quarter. They'll obviously get the opinion of their auditors. Yeah. Management's assertions corroborate with generally accepted accounting principles and their auditor will issue their opinion on the review, which is every quarter, and then the audit opinion, which is at the end of the fiscal year, right? So that allows MicroStrategy to act more accurately reflect the underlying value of all their assets on their balance sheet when they report. Whereas, um, you know, you, it's more difficult when you're dealing with a liquid asset that you have to treat as an intangible. So how does this impact adoption yeah. of cryptocurrencies, right? I mean, it makes, doesn't it? give more clear, more just more clarity for um, institutions who may want to hold cryptocurrencies. They want to be able to hold it at fair value and they want to right. be able to market at fair value. Yes. So this is, uh, and, and very few people actually understand this, that fair value accounting for crypto assets is a watershed moment for institutional and corporate adoption. Yeah. Why as a public company would I ever want to hold an asset that is volatile, yeah. that has a developed market away from me at cost? 
unless it's advantageous to do that, right? Yeah. And if it doubles in value, I want to be able to reflect that. Right. Right? So it allow the new accounting, you know, the proposed accounting rule, um, it's not a new rule, it's, it's an existing rule, but now it's going to be applied to digital assets, right? So now the CFO is not going to probably... Uh, it, it gets more conservative. It, it, the biggest, most liquid digital assets, cryptocurrencies, um, you apply fair market accounting to, but you want to be really conservative if you, if for whatever reason, uh, for instance, mining companies that, mine, that might mine a small proof of work coin. Yeah. Right? Um, like Eternity is a small proof of work coin. And... Um, it's certainly not as liquid as Bitcoin. So they may, ter- they may take a more conservative accounting approach to it, right? Whereas before you didn't have that option, you booked it one way. Now right. you book it as uh, uh, based on fair value accounting methods, right? So what, another thing that happened is under US GAAP, this was the case where you had to book it as an intangible asset. You also have to book it as an intangible asset under the IFRS rules, right? Mm -hmm. So what happened was the United States just advanced past the rest of the world when it came to how you treat the value of cryptocurrencies for financial reporting purposes. right? Right. So tax and financial reporting are two different things in the United States. They are divorced. Right. And the rest, in in many other jurisdictions outside the United States, they are married. Right? However, you brought up tax, so I'm going to bring up this topic because two weeks ago, I believe it's the state of Colorado um, has decided that they're going to allow taxpayers to pay for their taxes with crypto. Yeah, they've been doing that in Zoom forever. Really? Yeah, it's not, that's, you know, okay, it's about time. And I'm not gonna talk about tax because tax is even more complicated than financial reporting, right? The right. US have rules that govern financial reporting. So- But it, it feels like in general though, however, we are getting like clarity in the various areas that that so whether it's tax, whether it's financial reporting, we, we seem to be getting, whether it's, you know, the SEC and it feels like we're getting more clarity across we're, the board. We're starting to, but there are people who are very adamant about getting regulatory clarity, which is to say that they don't want cryptocurrencies to be treated or tokens to be treated as securities, right? Right. And to be quite honest, I'm not sure there's a way around that. If if Ripple wins this lawsuit, yeah, then you know maybe there will be some sort of uh, change. But I, you got to understand that 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 Howey test has been the bedrock of our capital markets traditional capital markets for a long time. What yeah. happens to traditional securities? See, that's too complicated. And I, we, I, I frankly can't see if you're dependent upon a group of people and you're expecting a profit and you paid money for the thing that you expect to gain a profit from, you're, I, I, I just don't, I don't think there's a way out. I mean, yeah. And a lot of these people are screaming and yelling and blah, blah, blah. It's like, get a bigger standing army or find some Ruth Bader Ginsburg type who's hell bent and has an agenda. She'll take your case or he will take your case and will take you all the way up, right? Assuming you lost at a lower court, right? And, you know, he or she's going to have to win. Do you know how many briefs would be filed in opposition to that? Because large law firms make a lot of their money on securities law practice. Right, right. right. Paul right. Weiss, Aiken Gump, White and Case. I mean, the name goes on. Every single one of them has a huge 
Securities law practice. They handle the world's largest corporations. Right. Securities laws are, are not going away. Believe me, they're not going away. I really, never mind. I, 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 can't, I personally can't see it. If someone else wants to get up here and debate me, fine. But I've lived under that regime for 25 years. And I just, I cannot see it right now. Yeah. So, but with respect to the change in the ability to treat digital assets as into, uh, uh, with fair market accounting yeah. is a huge, huge, huge impact. It's gonna have a huge impact. If you look at custodians, Custodians accept your assets and they book it on their balance sheet as an asset of theirs. Right. There's an offsetting liability because they yes. owe it to you, right? Right, right. This fair market value accounting makes custodying from an accounting standpoint, it impacts uh, custody businesses. They have to be keeping up with the fluctuations, right? If you're a bank, like Bank of New York just announced that they're now offering custody for a Bitcoin. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Right? Uh, NASDAQ's getting together with Coinbase and I forget who else to offer custody service and institutional services. When you're a bank, you book your client's assets as your own. And you record a liability because you owe those assets to them, right? I see. Your current assets you hold, and it's a current liability because it's got to be paid on demand. Right. Right. And to the, I'm not going to get into leverage or anything like that, but this, people need to realize this is a huge deal. The market's not reflecting it because I'm not sure the market understands just how big this really is. Now, this is just the United States. Yeah. This is not the rest of the world yet. But I got to believe that the ISB, which is, you know, IFRS, is going to get together and they're going to follow the United States. But the United States is in the lead when it comes to treating crypto assets from an accounting standpoint. Now, which is which is refreshing. Yeah. We're usually behind. <laughs> yeah. People are probably asked, well, how does that, what does that mean for NFTs? Well, NFTs, in my opinion, and it's only my opinion, are appropriately classified as an intangible asset. Why is that? Because they're non-fungible. Correct. There's only one of them. <laughs> Got that There's right. only one of them. There is no market for them. And when a market develops, it's a single transfer of a single asset for a single price from one person or entity to another, right? So we develop process control NFTs that right. represent controls over accounting, audit, financial reporting, and analysis processes, right? Yeah. So certain CFOs might actually take the position um, the way you would treat software. Yeah. Right? Like intellectual so, property. Correct. But in our case, these things generate income for the owners every time they're used on the network, right? So now how do you value that, Right. That's probably different. like the average monthly value or something or revenue. And then or when you go, if they go to sell them, they have to record a gain on sale of the asset, right? So, but JPEG NFTs, art NFTs, if I were a CEO and I was permitted, I would record them um, as an intangible. I would probably record them as an intangible asset. I would want to be really conservative. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not like these things trade every day and there's only one of them. So what else can you do? So when when is this likely to become a final decision and then implemented? And um, I have to read the codification, but uh, and I don't think there is codification. And what does this mean for accountants that they've they've got a kind of get some education on? on how to well, class the average accountant in crypto is doing tax remember right, that, right right 
So um, the accountants that are going to deal with this particular topic are CFOs and large company accountants. Big guys that right? have to public be company paid. accountants, gap accountants. Right? Yeah. At the big four and the little four. Um, so because those are the ones that perform audits on, you know, most public companies. So. And does this mean that there's, it's safer ground for there to be more entities taking the same approach that Tesla and MicroStrategy did? Like why, well, why, Tesla, why? Tesla and MicroStrategy did things that will be done different in the future, assuming this, you know, becomes okay. a final, becomes, becomes final, right? So, um, but every public company that holds, and not just public companies, but private companies as well, um, anybody who uses FASB rules, which is, you know, Everyone. almost every company. Yeah. Uh, past a certain size, right? It's generally accepted accounting principles. And generally accepted accounting principles has a regulator, and it's called the Federal Accounting Standards Board. Right. right. So everybody is, you have, you'll have the flexibility. So it, it really depends upon the company. If they want to continue to treat it as an intangible asset, because maybe they believe it's not really going to be that volatile or it's not going to rise in value, but banks are, if I'm a bank, I want to be able to, that thing flickers on a ticker. Yeah. Those things flicker on a ticker. I want to be able to use fair value accounting rules. It's yeah. something that I would treat my patents with, right? Yeah. Now we're, you know, we are believers, but, you know, for those who are still sitting on the sidelines, like why would an entity want to hold Bitcoin? Like what's the rationale that you think um, you know, a, comp a company that's not a bank or is not in, in, the, in the financial sector, but is being asked to consider holding cryptocurrencies. Why, what is the rationale? Well, well, you asked, why would they hold Bitcoin? So that would be a different answer if it was, why would they want to hold Ether or Cardano? Yeah. Or let's just start with, big, let's start with the granddaddy, big so, Bitcoin. Michael Saylor and MicroStrategy have their reasons, yeah. it, right? But if you consider the fact that an ETF is also a reporting entity. Yeah. An ETF is a reporting entity. They've yeah. got to comply with gap rules just like any other company, right? Right. They, they record, in, you know, the, the, the purchase and sale of investments, uh, as such, but think about it. Um, if anybody is able to get a hold of the comments letters that the SEC sends back to anyone who's ever filed to register an ETF, a Bitcoin ETF, that will give you a lot of clues as to um, their reasoning. Right. Yeah. And it's not just because it's Bitcoin or it's unique. If, for instance, there were um, future Bitcoin futures ETFs. Now, that's a basket of assets that are traditional. Right. We're just betting on the direction of Bitcoin. But the instrument that you're holding is well regulated and trades on a well regulated exchange. Right. Bitcoin does not yet. Things aren't regulated the way, you know, the CME is or the uh, CBOE is or Chicago Mercantile Exchange is, right? That's well-established, well-settled law, well-settled regulation, because they also have interest, uh, you know, surveillance agreements between them, right? In order to inhibit manipulation, manipulative activity, not prohibit, inhibit, right? Um, because they're gatekeepers. Right. We talked about gatekeepers last time. Yes. So, yes. Um, but I think this gives a lot of, it's a watershed moment. And I think it's going to play a role in declaring an e, a Bitcoin ETF public. Bitcoin needs to trade on regulated exchanges before 
a Bitcoin spot Bitcoin ETF can Ooh. can be can be declared effective. The SEC doesn't approve or disapprove of anything. Yeah, they declare it effective, or they don't. Right. And it's all about full and fair disclosure. So when you say that, do you mean so? Right now, we could trade. You know, Bitcoin on like exchanges like, you know, Bittrex and Binance and Kraken. But are you talking about me being able to open up my Thinkorswim from TD Ameritrade and being able to trade Bitcoin? Yes, but the question is, what regulations would a Bitcoin uh, exchange division of T TD Ameritrade abide by? The They're government by. Yet. Yeah. There aren't any yet. I right? See. Yeah. So, uh, and they do now. I think Interactive Brokers, TD, I think TD Ameritrade, I'm not sure. Um, but a lot of these, you know, the, the larger banks are here. There's a stampede into the space by now, yeah. right? And as soon as we get additional, like, if, for instance, Bitcoin is regulated under uh, uh, CFTC rules, right? As yeah. a commodity. That's when you'll start to see the ability for ETF, spot ETFs, which is a security. Right. Keep in mind, Bitcoin has not been declared a security, right? But an ETF, an ETF is a security. Hands down. Yeah. Right? So. So what is what is it that um, Brad Garlinghouse and them do? It, those aren't ETFs. What would you classify the GBTC and the uh, what's the symbol? Because you can actually trade. I thought was what it is is a basket of digital assets. So Grace, on a regular exchange through Grace Grayscale. Grace has a bunch of, they are the largest asset manager in crypto. Right. To crypto, right? GBTC is the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. They okay. have an Ether Trust. They've got a, poly, I think they have a Polygon Trust. They've got a Filecoin Trust. I mean, they've got a bunch of them now. Right. right. Those are securities. Okay. The underlying asset There's no declaration. There's no clarity as to what it is yet. Hmm. The SEC says they're all securities. With right. the exception of Bitcoin, maybe Ethereum, right? I know William Hinman has become a very controversial figure. He used to work at the SEC. Um, he's the subject of a lot of discovery in the Ripple case, right? Which I'm not going to get into. Right. However... I will say that I think, I don't know, but if those Ripple Army people purchased Ripple directly from Ripple Labs with the expectation of making money and they tendered value for it, it was an exchange of value for it, I, I am at a loss as to how that could not be ruled in a final ruling, if they get that far, as the illegal distribution and the illegal offer and sale of an unregistered non-exempt security. The fact that it flickers on a ticker is totally separate from the initial offer and sale of the thing in, con in question. And the thing in question is XRP, right? Yeah. So. And is that how they raise their, their initial uh, funds? Like, or are they both sort of VC funded as well as having done an a ICO? Well, I don't know if they did an ICO. I don't, I don't recall either. An ICO. I don't remember when they actually sold Ripple, and I don't know the method by which they sold it, so I can't tell you. Right? Yeah. 
It'll be oh. interesting. I'll 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 do a little research and we can post it if we if we find that out. But I I assume most of the XRP has been bought through exchanges. I, I'm not sure how what percentage was bought right, but directly Ripple from Ripple Labs. Ripple Labs sold a lot of XRP on those exchanges. Who bought them? People, other people bought them, yeah. right? Exchanges themselves may not have bought them or didn't buy them. Yeah. So, um, well, anything else you want to flag on this um, decision by the FASB? What is the impact for audit chain? Um, does it does it impact anything from in terms of what we continue to build, or is it more just validation that hey, regulation is coming? Be ready to be able to. It's not coming. It's not coming. It's here. here. <laughs> you keep on it's saying. Here. Gary Gensler will tell you that it was drafted in 1934 and settled in 1946, I believe. Right, SEC v. W. P. Howie. Yeah. So, um, accounting is so important. How you how you report or how you treat these things is so friggin' critical. Yeah. In order for public companies, including banks and institutions, that report to shareholders. Yeah, it's really important. It's how you measure performance quarter to quarter. It's how you value, evaluate if you're looking to sell or buy or acquire. Like it's yeah, you're a hundred percent right. You know, so clarity as far as accounting as it relates to Bitcoin and other digital assets is is a major major move. This is a really big deal. It really is. It's exciting. It reminds me, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of, um, and I might get the organization wrong, but I remember, I think in Canada, it's the FTC, but I remember when they were going through trying to regulate the internet and trying to set some standards and set some rules and trying to figure out who's going to govern it. And, you know, um, it feels like we're, we're, we're going through those similar machinations right now. Yeah. See, it, it, regulators are like, I keep thinking of that scene in, to, uh, was it um, Predator? If it bleeds, we can kill it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're like new meat. <laughs> if it flickers on a ticker, we can regulate it. Well, it's probably been really boring in their industry for a while. Now it's like, okay, we've got a whole new class a whole new asset class or a whole new um, discipline and a whole new set of standards to develop. And so it's, I, but I think a lot of people in who are sort of, who thought that we were going to sort of destroy the system or are more inclined to wanting to do that, or like, I'm sure this is, this is a bit of, a bit of a, a disappointment because what is what's really happening is the system is adopting but the new technology it, it's, it's, you're not oh, destroying it's, adopting, it's not only adopting it's adapting yes slowly but it's adapting you know who else is adapting the crypto space is adapting yeah they have to so what's happening is there's a comp slow but steady compromise that is yes. beginning to occur and in 10 years, crypto blockchain is going to be part of life. Securities will be made out of cryptography. Yes. Right? Yes. Uh, all securities will be made out of cryptography. Yeah. So. And decentralization where it makes sense is going to be like a, just a, a, a model that's, that's used as it's part of innovation, right? Eliminating points of failure. But when you're regulated, you can't, certain aspects, Ethereum, in my violent opinion, my, this, I am violently determined when I say Ethereum is centralized now because 
You may think a smart contract that's deployed onto the Ethereum chain is decentralized, but the validators who control this four validators that control more than 60%, three validators that control more than 60% of the ETH at stake required yeah. to validate, that's centralized. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So if Vitalik says we should make an implementation, then the community rallies together and they write an EIP and they chew it up and uh, they either pass it or they don't. But Bitcoin, Bitcoin is the only true decentralized blockchain network. You, You didn't want to talk about how Credit Suisse was saved? Oh. Well, let's do it. I thought you it's said you did, you said this was the only topic. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, let, let, let's cover it because people are asking, you know, why did the U.S. send three point one billion over to the Swiss National Bank? The okay, answer, let, the answer me, is, you know, what do you think they did with it? They bailed out. You know, they provided a short term loan to Credit Suisse. Just the U.S. or was this? Do you think this was a bunch of? The different European. I countries. think the U.S. contributed to what was more, because the U.S. is greatly exposed to you know, Credit Suisse is a systemically important institution. Right. They're not just located in Switzerland. Yeah. Right. They're all over the United. You know, the United. They're a very big player in the United States and other parts of the world. So. So whatever whatever junk they were holding, whatever these these CDOs were that are sort of not as... as, Well, the uh, other thing is that a week and a half ago, um, the UK reversed some of its policies and it gave a little lift to the bond market. So that may have contributed to... Saving. uh, It may have pulled them off the... Yeah, pulled them off the ledge. Yeah. Well, the market... is not going away. The market believes that they have been saved because they definitely like. I think they had two days of, of, um, you know, their stock price going higher. So, the market believes something. They have been saved in some way or another. For now, yeah. So there's probably they probably fit the criteria of too big to fail. There's probably too many dominoes that would have fallen had they been allowed to fail. Um, yeah. <laughs> there, I think they had to raise what? What was it that Jamie Dimon said? They had to raise like nine billion or or something. So I don't know if, if it was that that high, but they had to raise a significant amount of money. When these things happen, all the banks get together because they all own paper held by that bank, and if that bank fails then it's going to affect the books of all the other banks. Yeah. It so felt like Jamie Dimon was out on a marketing campaign this week. Well, talking and jawboning also works, right? Yeah. So yeah. You don't have to do anything. If the right person does the right type of jawboning, <laughs> you can, um, you know, I mean, when the opposite occurs, when the jawbone goes in the other direction, right? Yeah. A rumor, a rumor becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, becomes reality, right? Yeah. So, yeah. On that note. Well, stay tuned. Next week, we will have more to talk about. So everybody have an excellent week and thanks for joining us. Thank you. <laughs>